Hey, welcome back to the South Stands, a Buckeye football podcast by Ohio State fans for Ohio State fans from the West Coast. I'm your host, Zach Moore. Today is Sunday, November 17th, 2024. And thank you for joining me as I talk to myself about number two Ohio State's 31-7 victory over Northwestern at Wrigley Field in Chicago yesterday. Now, I think we can file this one under workmanlike victory for the Buckeyes. It was not their best effort. It didn't have to be. Now, after a sluggish, scoreless first quarter in which the Buckeye offense only had one possession and the defense allowed 118 yards to one of the worst offenses in the country, the Buckeyes would find their footing in the second quarter. Northwestern drew first blood on an eight-yard touchdown run by Jack Lausch to take a 7-0 lead. Then the Buckeyes would go on a 31-zip run to ice the game. So, as I normally do on Sundays, I'm going to tick down a short list of observations from this game. Overall, I'd grade this a B performance by the Buckeyes. The offense left some points on the field. The defense didn't really show up until the second quarter. And for the second week in a row, there were a lot of reps for Ohio State reserves, especially on the defensive line. 26 players logged defensive snaps for the Buckeyes in this game. Caden Curry, Kenyatta Jackson, Caden McDonald, Edric Houston, and Jermaine Matthews all logged their second highest snap counts of the season in this game. The Silver Bullets, as I said, were sluggish in the first quarter. It was, again, not their best effort. And the Northwestern offense, coming off a bye week, they were pretty frisky. I think they surprised the Buckeye defense by taking a lot of shots downfield in the passing game. Now, the Wildcats came into this game 120th nationally in passing offense, but quarterback Jack Lausch came out chucking it. He was 6 of 7 for 85 yards passing in the first quarter with pass completions of 22, 21, and 15 yards. And the Wildcat passing attack was also buoyed by the return of probably their best receiver, senior Bryce Kurtz, who hadn't played in a month. And Kurtz was good for them yesterday. He finished with seven receptions on 10 targets for 92 yards. Those 92 receiving yards were the second highest total by an opposing receiver against the Buckeyes this season. Only Evan Stewart of Oregon had more. And Kurtz, he beat Denzel Burke several times for big catches in this game. He got Burke twice on Northwestern's only scoring drive, one for 21 yards and another for 12 yards. That second 12-yard catch was on third and 10. We also saw another <laughs> pass interference penalty from Davis and Igbenosin in this game. That was in the third quarter on first and 10 from the Ohio State 28-yard line. Now give Igbenosin credit. Four plays later, he had the big pass break up on fourth down to end that Northwestern scoring threat. But that was Igbenosin's 10th penalty of the season, which, according to PFF, makes him the most penalized player in the Power Four. And he's tied with two other players, one from Nevada and another from New Mexico, for the most penalized player in the FBS. And that is a dubious distinction for Davis and Igbenosin. Now, in the end, the catches that Burke gave up to Kurtz and the P.I. by Igbenosin didn't really matter. Jack Lausch and the Northwestern offense just weren't good enough to take advantage you know, of, of their weaknesses in coverage for four quarters. You know, the Buckeyes were up 31-7 when Igbenosin committed that P.I. But, look, I worry about what might happen when the Buckeyes face another capable passing attack. Will we see a repeat of what happened against Oregon? Because now the book is out on both Burke and Igbenosin. Opposing offenses know that Burke is gettable in press coverage. Burke has trouble finding the football when it's in the air. He has trouble competing for the football when it's in the air. And, and opposing offenses know that Igbenosin is good for at least one pass interference penalty per game. Probably more than that against an offense that, that would be willing to test him more than Northwestern did yesterday. Jermaine Matthews also struggled in coverage yesterday. He finished with the defense's worst overall PFF grade of 46.6 and second worst coverage grade of 46.3. The Buckeyes are going to they're going to see a very efficient Indiana passing attack next week. That's really good at executing those back shoulder throws, which are really difficult to defend anyway, but they're exceptional at it. Now, Curtis Work is completing 72% of his passes. He has two very good receivers in Elijah Surratt and Omar Cooper Jr., who are averaging 18 and 22 yards per reception, respectively. 
And like Ohio State, Indiana's offensive line is a Joe Moore Award semifinalist. They do a pretty good job of protecting Rourke. If there's a path to victory for the Hoosiers next Saturday, it almost certainly includes throwing at the Buckeye corners early and often. This is a matchup, folks, that I'm I'm mostly concerned about next Saturday. It's, it's the one matchup that concerns me the most. If Burke, Igbenosin, and Matthews aren't infinitely better in coverage than they were yesterday, Indiana has a real shot to win that game. Ohio State had a season-high 29 pressures of Jack Lausch yesterday, and much of that pressure came on blitzes, mostly from Buckeye linebackers, but the safeties got into the mix as well. According to PFF, Sonny Styles had eight pass rush snaps, Cody Simon had seven, C.J. Hicks had six, Arvell Reese and Lathan Ransom each had four. And on Northwestern's very first offensive play of the game, Jim Knowles sent Davis and Igbenosin on a blitz, and he whiffed on Jack Lausch. Now, Lausch is pretty slippery. He's a good athlete. But I thought there were a few other instances yesterday where Ohio State blitzers overran the play, and that allowed Lausch to to escape the pocket and, and make a play downfield. I'd like to know how the coaching staff felt about the yield from bringing that much pressure. The Buckeyes finished the day with four sacks, six tackles for loss, and then there was the forced fumble by Jack Sawyer on Lausch. Lausch was forced to leave the pocket. Sawyer got him from behind to jar the ball loose, which was recovered by Davis and Igbenosin. But considering how much they blitzed and the competition, I mean, Northwestern came into this game 131st nationally in total offense. Can we consider four sacks, six tackles for loss, and one turnover a productive yield? I'm not sure that we can. Maybe I'm nitpicking here, but I do wonder if Jim Knowles is going to back off the pressure next Saturday against Indiana. And he was able to blitz with abandon against two of the worst offenses in the FBS the last two weeks. I'm not sure he can afford to blitz that much against the Hoosiers next Saturday. So it'll be interesting to see how Knowles will approach pressuring Curtis Rourke in that game. Jack Sawyer finished yesterday with the defense's highest PFF grade of 90.4. He led the Buckeyes in pressures with seven. He also finished with seven tackles, which tied him for the team lead with Arbel Reese. And he had the aforementioned forced fumble on Jack Lausch. I thought Sonny Styles played his best game of the season. Styles finished with two sacks and two pass breakups. He also he was also second on the team in pressures with four. Styles continues to ascend at linebacker. He seems to be getting more and more comfortable there with every snap. I, I love the growth that we're seeing from Sonny Styles. Thought it was also a really good day of tackling across the board for the defense. Only seven missed tackles for the Buckeyes, and they had eight different players finish with PFF tackling grades of 75 or higher. Caleb Downs, of course, led all Ohio State defenders with a tackling grade of 84.1. Man, Downs is a fucking heat-seeking missile. I mean, not since Michael Doss, who also wore number two, and has a, he had a similar body type to Downs, by the way. Not since Doss. Has there been a tackler in the Ohio State secondary as devastating as Downs? Now, there was a sequence in the third quarter that probably brought tears of joy to Jim Knowles' eyes. It was after the Davis and Igbenosin pass interference penalty that set Northwestern up first and 10 from the Ohio State 21-yard line. The next three plays went like this. Jordan Hancock makes an excellent open field tackle on Cam Porter for a three-yard gain on first down. On second down, Caleb Downs drops their tight end, Marshall Lang, for a one-yard loss on a perfect form tackle. Then on third down, Lathan Ransom shoots up the middle on a run blitz to drop Cam Porter for a two-yard loss. That set up the fourth and ten pass that Igbenosin broke up to end that scoring threat. We all kind of smirk when, when we hear, when folks refer to Jim Knowles' defense as a safety-driven defense. Well, Those were his three starting safeties, all making big tackles in the open field, two of them for a loss to snuff out that scoring threat. I think what what has made Ohio State so good at preventing red zone touchdowns this season is the athleticism, physicality, and versatility of Downs, Ransom, and Hancock. All three of those guys can cover, tackle, and they love to play the run. I think they're the three best players on this defense, actually, hands down. So kudos to Downs, Ransom, and Hancock. They were excellent yesterday. Now, after only one first quarter possession that ended with a punt after Jeremiah Smith's 37-yard touchdown catch was overturned by replay, the Ohio State offense would score touchdowns on their next four possessions. The game ball goes to Carnell Tate. 
the Chicago native playing in front of 30 some friends and family yesterday. Tate caught two touchdown passes, including a gorgeous diving catch from 25 yards out to put the Buckeyes up 21 7 in the second quarter. Tate also had a fantastic 14 yard reception down to the one yard line with a defender draped all over him to set up Ohio State's first touchdown of the game. Like Sonny Styles at linebacker, we're starting to see Carnell Tate come of age at receiver. He has emerged from the shadows of Jeremiah Smith and Emeka Ibuka to become a legitimate threat in the passing game. On the telecast yesterday, Jake Butt called Tate the best third receiver in America, but said Tate would probably be, he'd be wide receiver one at 90 other teams in the, in the country, and he's not wrong about that. So... Absolutely love what I'm seeing from Carnell Tate starting to emerge as a legitimate threat for this offense. And the future is very, very bright for Carnell Tate. Jeremiah Smith actually led the Buckeyes in receiving yards with 100. And that included an electric 68-yard catch and run on Ohio State's first possession of the third quarter. But Smith injured his ankle on the play. One of the Northwestern defensive backs could be seen attempting to twist Smith's ankle at the end of the play. Smith had to leave the game briefly to have his ankle taped up, but he did return. This is a situation worth monitoring, though, because anyone who's ever turned an ankle will tell you that those tend to get worse the day after. Now, hopefully Smith won't be limited by that, that, that tweak of his ankle against Indiana. No doubt he'll be getting treatment on that thing all week long. But, but again, that's a situation worth monitoring. I thought Will Howard was very good again yesterday, 15 to 24 for 247 yards and two touchdown passes. He had a couple of throws I'm sure he'd like to have back, but for the second straight week, he played a mostly mistake-free game with no turnovers and he was not sacked. It took a minute for the Ohio State running game to get going. Only 11 rushing yards on five carries in the first quarter. Again, they only had the one possession. But after the first quarter, the Buckeyes ran for 162 yards on 28 carries and two touchdowns runs, both by Quinchon Judkins. Judkins and Trevion Henderson combined for 150 yards rushing on 26 carries against a very good Northwestern rush defense that came into this game 16th nationally against the run. Now, I thought Chip Kelly could have leaned a little bit more on the run game in the fourth quarter than he did. The offensive line was really starting to get control of the line of scrimmage at that stage. But Kelly called a couple of failed pass plays in short yardage situations in the fourth quarter that ended two promising Ohio State drives. Maybe he was experimenting there. I mean, the game was clearly in hand at that stage, but would have liked to see Kelly lean a little bit more on the run game in the fourth quarter there. I think Ohio State probably puts a a few more points on the board if they do. But it's academic at this point. And again, you know, clearly Kelly was 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 probably experimenting there. I thought the offensive line was very good again yesterday. Donovan Jackson led the team with a PFF pass blocking grade of 83.1. Carson Hinsman was right behind him with a pass blocking grade of 79.9. Now they'll be facing a much bigger test next Saturday in Indiana's Mikhail Kamara. Kamara leads the Big Ten in sacks with nine and a half. But it was another hurdle cleared by Jackson and Hinsman yesterday. I, I've been calling this a week-to-week situation, right? Every week is going to bring a new challenge for those two. But they were really good. Will Howard was not sacked. Northwestern only had two tackles for loss. The Buckeyes averaged over five yards per carry in the run game. I mean, those are the metrics that I really care about when it comes to the offensive line. So, you know, so far, offensive line, you know, playing really, really well. And that left side has not been the issue that we all thought it was. I mean, (laughs) coming out of that Nebraska game, it looked like the left side of the offensive line might derail the whole frickin' season. But, uh, But we're a long way from that point. And kudos to Jackson and Hinsman for that. So, you know, without really bringing everything they have to bear to win this game, the Buckeyes handled their business yesterday, and that sets up another top five matchup for Ohio State, their third of the season with Indiana next Saturday in the Horseshoe. I thought this post from Ross Dellinger on X yesterday put this game into perspective. Dellinger said, quote, wild stat. Ohio State will play in its third top five matchup of this season next Saturday against the Hoosiers. Indiana will play in its first top five matchup ever in the regular season, end quote. (laughs) So that puts that really puts things into perspective uh, when we're talking about where these two programs are uh, in their history. Uh, This is a first program first for Indiana and for Ohio State. It's the third time this season 
that they're in this situation facing a top five opponent. Now, the early line on this game is Ohio State minus 10 and a half. It'll be another noon Eastern kick on Fox in the horseshoe. I'm going to have a lot more to say when Paige, Chad, and I break this game down on Thursday. But I would caution Ohio State fans who are dismissing Indiana because of their schedule. And it's true. Look, the Hoosiers schedule has been an abomination. In the non-conference, they played two FCS teams and Charlotte, who's barely an FBS team. And in Big Ten play, they faced only one team that currently has a winning record, and that's Washington, which is six and five. But they've still played a Big Ten schedule. And against that schedule, Indiana has eviscerated everyone except Michigan. And they have a statistical profile, and I'm going to get into this on Thursday, that matches and in some cases exceeds all the other playoff contenders. I think the Buckeyes are going to have to bring their A game to beat the Hoosiers next Saturday, but more to come on that this Thursday. So, okay, that's going to do it for me. Check your feeds on Thursday evening for our preview of the Indiana game. Until then, thanks so much for listening, and go Bucks. been listening to the south stands a buckeye football podcast follow us on x at south underscore stands